Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Pubs video. I'm in Fitzrovia today. This is an area that is named after its most famous pub, the Fitzroy Tavern, which is behind me right now. So it seems fitting that we start there. Cheers from the Fitzroy Tavern. You can probably see the BT Tower in the background. Those of you of a certain age will want to call the post office tower, I imagine. It's, as I mentioned earlier, a pub that has given its name to the area. Uh, and in turn, there is another Fitzrovia Tavern, I believe, in Fitzrovia somewhere, which uh, is a pub that has taken its name from the area, which has taken its name from a pub. The name originally comes from the Fitzroy family, the uh, Dukes of Grafton, is it? Who were landowners in the area, owned this uh, area of land on which this part of London now sits. And there was a pub or an establishment on this site going back to at least the 1820s and I found records going back to the 1830s of a Fitzroy coffee house so some sources on the web cite the original incarnation of this pub as 1880s I think it's at least 50 60 years older than that it eventually changed its name to the Fitzroy Tavern and it's this period of history between the two wars which were really its heyday it became a vocation for bohemians, for, for writers and artists it was associated with writers such as George Orwell and Dylan Thomas, artists such as Nina Hamnett and Augustus John. What's interesting and perhaps unreported about that cluster of artists and writers is that they were largely Welsh, or at least some of the most famous names were Welsh, starting with Nina Hamnett, born in Tenby. Her favourite drink was apparently a double rum and brandy. Try ordering that in a pub today. Augustus John, also a regular here, also born in Tenby, coincidentally, and he was uh, considered the most prolific portrait painter of his day, painted many famous luminaries of the era, including Tallulah Bankhead, Alistair Crowley, the occultist, Thomas Hardy and his friend and fellow drinker here at the pub, Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas was one of many writers associated with the area, along with George Orwell. Dylan Thomas, of course, also hailing from Wales. George Orwell, not so much. It's a Sam Smith's pub today. And in keeping with the theme of many of their, particularly London pubs, it has this recreation of a Victorian pub interior. But I don't think many parts of it are genuinely original, although it has won awards from camera for its outstanding conversion and or renovations. Impressive partition in the two sides of the public bar, interestingly both named public bar, on the doors that edge glazing there but of note both upstairs and downstairs there are open fires which already on this not particularly freezing cold day in October were lit which was nice oh, I should add on the uh, beer front Sam Smith's pub usual Sam Smith's lineup this is a now empty glass that previously contained old brewery bitter came in at two pounds 85 for a half so that's going to be just shy of six six pounds five seventy a bit of mental arithmetic there for a pint I would imagine Next up, and very much continuing that theme of uh, Fitzrovia's writers and artists, we have the Wheat Sheaf. So, cheers from the Wheat Sheaf. One of its lovely glazed windows behind me. I believe this is a 1930s re rebuild of a pub that again has a, a much longer history prior to that. It's in a sort of roughly mock Tudor kind of style, I suppose you could call it. And, um, and it's particularly noteworthy for the, the stained glass around the windows. It seems they actually depict the, I, I believe it's the coat of arms of different Scottish cities, uh, which is interesting. I'm not sure how that relates to the name Wheatsheaf. Possibly more of a literary leaning to this pub than the kind of general umbrella of artists and writers at the Fitzrovia. It's uh, famous for, again, Dylan Thomas and George Orwell, and sometimes the group of writers who congregated here were referred to as the Wheatsheaf writers. Dylan Thomas met his future wife, Caitlin McNamara, here in the pub. Beer-wise, I'm drinking a, a, a blonde, a little bit skeptical about it. It doesn't taste too great, grapefruity from a brewery called the Longman Brewery, which I'm quite fond of. I have to stop talking now because there's a, a guided tour probably doing some of the same spiel I'm doing. Of course, much has already been said elsewhere about Dylan Thomas and George Orwell, but I thought I would um, focus on one of the more minor writers associated with Fitzrovia in those days, and presumably a regular here at the Wheat Sheaf, a surrealist poet called Philip O'Connor. And um, he wrote some very bizarre, almost nightmarish poetry, uh, one of his more famous works. This is just an excerpt from it. I'm not even sure of the title of this. Did his poems even have titles? K 
Captain Busby may or may not be the title. Captain Busby put his beard in his mouth and sucked it, then took it out and spat on it, then put it in again and sucked on it, then walked on down the street thinking hard. Suddenly, he put his wedding ring in his trilby hat and put the hat on a passing kitten. Then he carefully calculated the width of the pavement with a pair of adjustable sugar tongs. This done, he knitted his brows. Then he walked on, thinking hard. I have a pair of sugar tongs with me. I don't think they're exactly the adjustable kind, but I will attempt to use them to measure the pavement here if I can find a uh, sort of brief gap in the traffic. So um, I'm not sure the, the proper process uh, because Philip O'Connor didn't go into the precise method by which this is done, but I think I'm causing a bit of a nuisance here. But um, probably isn't the first time they've seen people measuring the pavement with sugar tongues outside the wheat sheaf. You get the idea. Anyway, today the pub is owned by a very small pub co that I believe only owns one other pub, so I think we can call this independently owned. And there is, um, there's definitely still a tradition of sort of culture and or quirkiness associated with this pub. The New Sheridan Club, who are sort of an offshoot of the Chap magazine, some of you may be familiar with, have their, uh, I believe, monthly meetings here. I was a long time ago a member for a year, and I think I came along once or twice, and they do um, presentations on all sorts of weird and eclectic subjects in the, um, the upper room once a month. I think a noteworthy mention here should go to the Bricklayer's Arms around the corner from the Wheat Chief on Gress Street. Uh, it's another Sam Smith pub and we're going to be including a few of those on the tour today so I think I'm going to skip this one on the inside particularly as I recall that old thing about Sam Smith's pubs not allowing digital devices inside. They were particularly um, strict on that rule here and so you know an idiot trying to do um, crappy footage for a YouTube video it might well rub them up the wrong way but it's some it's an interesting building at least one source I saw said it's potentially Georgian I don't know I mean there has been a pub on this site since that era I think it was late 1790s or something the record to go back to in in this name as well and it does have this quite elaborate brickwork fit in between those beams uh, in something that to me looks a bit more sort of mock Tudor again rather than genuinely Georgian it just looks bit too well kept to be that old but who knows perhaps it could be a, uh, a, a Georgian survival here on, um, on Gress Street. Next up the champion. The blurb here may be a little bit rushed because I'm sitting outside so as not to contravene the uh, Sam Smith's no digital devices rule just being sort of surreptitiously taking little bits of video inside hoping nobody will notice and tell me off but it's raining. Anyway the champion um, Undoubtedly, the, the main feature here is the, uh, the stained glass windows. Really spectacular effect when you walk inside. And on a sunny day, that must be absolutely stunning. But even on a very gray, rainy day like today, that sort of glorious color and light as you walk through the door and see the, um, the stained glass windows gleaming through. Um, especially, you know, when you consider you know, one of the, the nature of stained glass windows is that from the, the outside, they often look a bit, you know, grey and unexciting. They're actually modern, uh, although the pub dates back to I believe the 1860s and was subject to a, a, I think a fairly well regarded sensitive restoration by Sam Smith's in something like the 1980s after a, an earlier um, refurbishment redesign in the 1950s. In the 1980s refurbishment I think a lot of these uh, stained glass windows were introduced and they're by uh, a stained glass window artist called Anne Sutheran who is I believe still working and you can still if you particularly like this style stained glass you could have her commission some windows for your own home. The figures depicted in the windows are champions of the latter half of the 19th century and they include figures such as uh, WG Grace the cricketer David Livingstone, the explorer, and Florence Nightingale, the nurse, who I believe is also the inventor of the pie chart. Well, I'm definitely getting rained on here, so um, <laughs> hopefully the the B-roll speaks for itself. The um, the shots, the brief though they are of the interior and that beautiful stained glass speaks for itself. There is um, an upstairs room as, as well, which is not nearly as ornate. All of the magic is happening on the, um, the ground floor. It's a uh, Sam Smith's pub, as noted. 
They didn't have the old berry bitter, instead this is, is it 4x best or something, a different bitter from them, which comes in at a, a amazingly cheap £1.95 for a half, so that would be just under £4 for a pint. Um, Sandsmiths are not any longer the you know bargain basement brewer uh, that they had been for, for many years in London, and it's quite easy to still spend ballpark £6 for a pint in a Sandsmiths pub, but um, that to me seems like an absolute bargain and uh, it's a lower ABV, I think three point something, but that's it's fine for me, it's lunchtime. <laughs> Next up, the Green Man. I'm a little bit apprehensive about this one. It was on camera's inventory of historic pub interiors, but it now the page there has a big warning saying it's undergone a refurb in 2020-ish and they haven't yet revisited to uh, reassess. So. Um, not quite sure what we're going to find inside. So naturally, you're staring at that frontage and thinking, Tweedy, that is a mixture of Larkivite and red coastal granite, probably Swedish, and we've seen that before at the Albert. And you'd be right, of course. I mean, you know, I don't need to tell you this, but uh, the darker grey granite down towards the bottom there, Larkivite. Um, I, I'm guessing this. I'm guessing this is all Scandinavian. I don't know that for sure, but uh, but that's, that's a thing you often get in this particular era. This rebuild was 1899, and those Scandinavian granites, as we saw at the Albert and the Westminster video, became popular from about the 1880s. And they often came in pairs like this, the sort of dark gray one and the, the reddish colored one for accent. All hope is not lost on the interior. It, it's definitely uh, been modernized a little bit in terms of the paint job, but some of the structure, I think, that was recorded in camera's interior inventory uh, pub heritage site is still there and particularly there's this very attractive sort of arched bit of um, gantry sort of woodwork above the bar towards the back of the bar which is still intact the name is interesting to me the green man because that's something that i would very much associate more with rural pubs and not sort of in in fitzrovia this kind of what is now a kind of media hub of, uh, of modern london the most expensive beer so far although in fairness landlord uh, timothy taylor's landlord is always uh does seem to be at the kind of upper end in any given pub so that was 334 up half anyway cheers i'm getting rained on again what i do for you lot next up and possibly another pub that has suffered in recent years from gastro pubification certainly looking at the paint job on the outside i don't hold particularly high hopes for this but it is on cameras inventory of historic pub interiors still um sorry about the car noise in the background this is the george well according to what pub cameras pub website this is a green king pub really didn't get that sense inside it, it is very very smart a very upmarket pub and i guess you could argue that possibly in the victorian era some pubs would feel like that. It was a bit more like being in a sort of smart restaurant than a pub. But, you know, I have been able to just order a pint or half a pint and sit and have a drink without the requirement to have food. Conflicted, I sort of like it. It, it isn't obviously banal, modern gastro pub nonsense. It's a slightly Disneylandized version of Victorian pub interiors. Um, but there are original features that support that, it's including an impressive bar back, uh, five panels there, and along the left-hand side of the pub, a combination of etched glass mirrors and pictures of equestrian scenes, people riding horses and that. If you're looking for a pubby pub, a sort of down-to-earth, cool blimey governor, apples and pears sort of pub, this probably isn't going to be it. But if you, if you, you know, if you're happy to sort of cosplay, for want of a better word, that you're a Victorian gentleman of, of some social standing going to one of the more refined pubs in the city, then uh, this, you know, sort of delivers that experience. Timothy Taylor's Bolt Maker on tap. This was again north of three pounds for a half, so we're talking well, well north of six pounds for a pint, but um, always, um, you know, a, a joy to drink whenever I find this. So yeah, overall, maybe a controversial verdict, but I'm going to give the George here a, a thumbs up, I think guessing here we have a bit more of that Scandinavian red possibly coastal granite oh look some blue sky and everything heading on to oh, what are we now at pub number next up the stag's head and the BT Tower the shop which I had to get in the middle of the road in order to take doesn't take an architecture degree to spot that the 
style of the building in which the stag's head in its current incarnation finds itself today is undeniably art deco cheers from the stag's head this is a fascinating chimera for want of a better word of a pub it has this 1930s art deco exterior that's the building that it exists in today the interior is in a sort of mock tudor-ish style can we call that mock tudor there's a lot of wood paneling I mean, certainly not, you know, you wouldn't call the interior Art Deco in style. But it's an odd mix between, like I say, it's Art Deco exterior, Mock Tudor interior. There are, you know, big TVs that they advertise showing Sky Sports or the big games, which is something that I would normally avoid, like the plague, let's be honest. The architects who designed this 1930s Art Deco building were called Marshall and Tweedy. Uh, promised no relation there. Okay, next and probably final pub of today's outing, the Carpenter's Arms. Lighting's a bit weird here, isn't it? Anyway, um, cheers from the Carpenter's Arms. More landlord on tap there. I think this came in at 3.25 for a half. Nice, it's got a handled glass. This is again on camera's inventory of historic national pub interiors. I have to admit, if I just sort of came into this pub randomly, it would not immediately jump out at me as being of a particular note on the interior and that's at least partly because it has a fair amount of my much hated fan ball bluey turquoisey paint around the edges but um it's, it's a 1930s pub 1938 in its current incarnation built by the wenlock brewery although there probably was a pub on this site going back to at least 1809, I think the records say. But was there, you know, there were a couple of fireplaces that had some, you know, borderline aesthetic merit to them and definitely felt quite 1930s. But there's one or two nooks there that were a bit more appealing than others with a bit of wood panelling and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I, it's a little bit lost on me why camera chose, particularly here, to mark as a historic pub interior. I think perhaps the exterior is a bit more interesting with the sort of tiled walls and that uh, Wenlock Brewery sign above the door. Okay, well, I'm not going into the Fitzrovia Bell here, but I uh, thought this might be an appropriate place to end the video as it has Fitzrovia in its name, more traffic noise. I think Fitzrovia is actually a really under the radar and really quite interesting area of London to visit for a pub tour, a crawl, it's certainly got a very high density of pubs and, uh, and I think there's uh, an interesting mix of sort of um, artistic and literary history here and different eras of sort of Victorian and 1930s pubs. You know, hopefully something that might appeal to a whole bunch of different people. So if I had to pick a favourite pub of the day, I'm probably going to say, I don't know, either the Wheat Chief maybe, um, just has a, a nice atmosphere, it's a bit more independent perhaps than some of the other pubs, lovely stained glass, but also, you know, the for, for stained glass, if, if, if that's what you're into, then I would say go to the Champion, which has this uh, amazing light and colour inside from those windows. And actually a, a notable mention probably ought to go to the George which surprised me as, a, as much as it might surprise anyone else. I thought that was going to just be bland gastro pub nonsense and um, but it did as I say it sort of recreated this kind of very genteel version of a Victorian pub in a slightly Disneylandish way but you know now and again maybe that's okay. So thank you very much for watching I hope some of that was interesting and or informative and or useful and I'll see you on the next one.